Welcome to the uh, June 20th, 2018 Select Board uh, hearing. Uh, ask the town administrator to read the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> First, we'll vote to amend or approve the agenda. Um, there's a recommendation to remove item number two, consideration of appointment. Um, and then uh, public comment. Consideration of consent agenda includes payroll warrant, Sherburne Community Center annual rent payment, and minutes, there are no minutes. And the next meeting is July 11th, 2018. Uh, consideration of land use and development matters municipal vulnerability preparedness program listening session with Gino Carlucci town planner and then introduction of concerns regarding windy low development 309 Elliott Street Natick then update on planning items for open space and recreation plan general plan with Marion Nutra from the planning board then town campus site plan with Sean clean CMD director Consideration of financial matters, financial update with Sharon McPherson, finance director, town accountant. And then under routine business, town administrator report, selectman reports, and adjourn. Just a question. Uh, when did we schedule the, all the year end transfers? Uh, the, this is July, July, 11th. July, 11th. July 11th. It'll be a joint meeting with advisory. So it has to happen uh, before July 15th. I understand that, but. All of my towns are doing stuff when they can. So we're going to hold everything until. I would, would imagine Sharon will review something. Um. Yeah, I mean, I can. I've been sending out like a weekly update on where we holding stand. everything. The next meeting is July 11th. Yeah, I understand. The problem <laughs> with holding everything is if there's an issue or a question, there's no tomorrow. Then. There, um, right. Right, but we don't have another meeting scheduled. And right now it looks like we'll be okay. Um, and we're asking people to come in, anyone who needs a transfer from those departments to come in. If something comes up, we can schedule a meeting the week of uh, the 25th or July 2nd. Well, it has what's to be date? done by the 15th. On the 15th. But, so you would have four days. Why don't we provisionally schedule another meeting? Mm hmm. Why don't Sorry. we provisionally schedule another meeting so it can be posted and we don't have to worry about it? I mean, you can do the 12th. Um, the Thursday is July 5th. That's a holiday weekend. Would it make sense to schedule it tentatively for Monday the 9th? Is that enough time? That's two days before the 11th, or do we want to do it the week of... Uh, Oh, I was thinking after the 11th, just in case something comes up as possible. Is there a certain is there a certain issue that needs to be brought in that has th that we're thinking of needs to come in that night? No, but I've been at <coughs> I've been at one of the advantages of being around for a while is I've been at meetings where the the uh, advisory committee and the board don't agree on something, and then. Now you're January, June, July 20th, 25th, you're trying to backdate things. I don't want to backdate anything. Mm -hmm. I think we could, I think Sharon's probably made the advisory committee aware of what's coming up and there's no, and she's telling us there's not any large issues that are out of well, maybe the advisory committee is aware of it, but I. I no, that is. A, she's it. telling us this. She sent a financial yeah, been, report today. Over yeah, I've been sending them out every week. She sent a financial I'm just, report. I'm just thinking if if the issue is that you might not agree with advisory, you might want to set the date after the 11th, not before it, because you won't be talking to advisory until the 11th, unless. We can try to convince advisory to schedule something earlier, but I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think they're meeting earlier than that. I don't think they're meeting again. So there was a report today? Yeah. Sent it out. Sharon's been sending these reports weekly. Yeah. That just kind of show where we're at. For the I thought, yeah, the, so the, I thought it was the library project. Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, no, I've been just sending this out every week. So now. I didn't open it. 
where we stand. I would propose if we have a meeting on the 11th already scheduled that we tentatively schedule a meeting for the 12th that we don't have to keep but that way if you know Paul's doomsday scenario comes up on the mm -hmm. 11th we have a, a meeting like on, the, on the 12th where we can fix it. stuff and David can David and Sharon in between the two meetings can figure out what's going on and okay. give us some advice mm, okay yeah, that makes sense to me yeah terrific why don't we schedule a meeting then for the 12th recognizing that we're probably not going to need it need it but <clears throat> terrific do I have a motion on the agenda as amended so moved second all in favor terrific um, Gino Carlucci our town planner is up on the, the next item is a listening session we about the consent agenda no? oh <laughs> thank you you have to at least give the consent. It can't you have be to have it right. explicit consent. <laughs> I was reading the vibes. I, I'm anticipating a vote. Is there a motion to um, approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll second it. All in favor? That's exactly. Oh, I was wait, getting... before we forget, <laughs> the reason why I asked for that item on the agenda is to remind me, because I've been carrying around $1. <laughs> Which is the rent from the Sherburn Community Center. Ta da! <laughs> Last year we got a check. Could we have a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> so, who do I turn this over to? I can't I'm touch I'm not cash. allowed to touch. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi has to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi's the only one that can touch cash. <laughs> this is a receipt. <laughs> this is, wait, this is a photo. Where is the <laughs> And a turnover? So it's going to cost twenty-five dollars to process the one, <laughs> the one dollar in rent. <laughs> thank you. Terrific. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Gino, the uh, yeah, Paul. Thank you for going to the uh, annual meeting where that is uh, that is proffered. Um, Gino, the listening session on municipal vulnerability preparedness program. It, it, would it be better for us to be out in the audience or? Okay, great. You're all, all set. Municipal Vulnerability Program, Preparedness Program is uh, a pro state program that's designed to address climate change impacts. It's set up similar to green communities and complete streets in the sense that you go through a process of becoming certified as an MVP community and then uh, you become eligible for grants. Only certified communities are eligible for the grants. So as part of the, it, it's, it's somewhat similar also uh, in focus to the um, hazard mitigation plan process, which is also in the final stages uh, for Sherburn uh, of being completed, um, except that it focuses on climate change impacts and not all types of uh, hazards. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, but because of that connection, we had the kind of the primary pr players in the hazard mitigation plan process also participate in the core team of the MVP process. That, that would be Sean Colleen, uh, Chief Thompson, and Chief uh, Kenny as, and myself and uh, Allery Brach. Um, the main, the main um, uh, components of the program were to hold a public workshop, which we held on April 10th, and we invited town officials as well as certain uh, um, stakeholders, Mass Audubon, and um, citizen groups. 
and um, we had about 16 people here on on April 10th that went through and developed or identified um, vulnerable areas as well as came up with a list of priorities which we'll go through <coughs> shortly here and um, the um, the final step in this certification process is to have this listening session which we're doing tonight so with that uh, to get into more background I'll turn it over to Mary Mo Mo Monahan from Fuss and O'Neill and Kevin McGarry is also an engineer from Fuss and O'Neill who's here if, if any uh, technical questions arise Mary hey okay, thank you Gina and, and thank you. Um, so brief introduction, um, as Gino said, I'm Mary Monaghan. A couple of you might remember me from a number of years ago. I used to appear before your board and I did some of your MS4 work. Um, so I'm back and we're talking MVP, all these acronyms. And as Gino noted, there was a grant opportunity about a year ago and the town of Sherborne took advantage of it. And um, Fuss and O'Neill, as your project team, we helped execute an MVP program for the community. So my background as part of this project team is actually in municipal management. I'm a former town administrator, public works director. Um, as people tell me, my skill set is I'm able to get that engineering and or design project to fit into that th those public constraints and opportunities um, and we use that a lot in this MVP process and as Gino noted Kevin's with me tonight and all of this ultimately leads to some priorities that may require some engineering support and or construction and you'll see how we got there and you'll see um, the decisions that the town made in, in getting you to that point so I'll introduce briefly the MVP. We'll talk a little bit about climate change. Um, I'll discuss with you the summary of findings that came out of your stakeholders and your residents. It, this is a program that reflects the needs of Sherbin, not, not the Commonwealth of Mass or any other community. And um, then we're gonna talk about the next potential funding program that having an MVP designation means to the town. So, it's, it was exactly a year ago that <coughs> the Commonwealth of Mass issued their first round of MVP grants, and the town of Sherbin was one of 66 within that first round of grant programs. Um, a total of 71 communities are considered MVP at this point because five of them had already gone through enough of a climate change and resiliency process that they got automatically certified as MVP. This is a very prescriptive process. Um, it's not something, the scope of work that Fuss and O'Neill imagined or any other consultant or regional planning agency. Those of us who have supported these MVP projects needed to go through day-long training in order to understand the process and making sure that all of the outcomes reflected the input from the community. Um, as Fuss and O'Neill, we have eight of our staff went through this training and we completed 10 of these MVP programs on that first cycle of 66. And we just recently were successful in getting six additional communities funded to begin the same process that you're now completing. So this approach required us to work with your stakeholders to consider climate change in the context of your infrastructure, your society, and the environment. And at the end of this is a final report which has already been distributed to, to the, Gino, you, know, you got a copy of it. I put hard copies on the select board's desk tonight. Um, and it's basically a road print to, blueprint, as to how you're going to begin, um, what you did to identify those priorities and what you want to do to address those priorities. The good news back then, it was people would laugh at me and say, yeah, the state's never going to do this is the Commonwealth of Mass promised at the time that if you were designated an MVP community, you were going to get enhanced access to state grant funding programs, and they were going to begin developing a specific grant program for MVP communities, and they did do that. So six weeks ago, they came out with their first MVP action grant. We'll talk a little bit more about that later after we review your priorities, but what that MVP action grant did was it provided almost $3 million worth of 
grants to MVP designated communities who had completed the MVP process. You weren't quite there yet, so we weren't able to bring you through to a grant application at that point. But we were able to, in our other, in six of our other communities, assist. And there's an additional 800,000 that six of our MVP communities received in grant awards. EEA, who runs this program, has said that for communities like Sherbin, who were in the schedule, um, not ready to submit an application, they anticipate another grant round coming out in July. So we look forward to working with Gino and the rest of the town in submitting an application to fund your priorities that came out of this process. So this is the project team. These are, these are the folks in your community that participated in the discussions, beginning with a, an initial core team meeting, and then a community resilience building workshop process which we held in this room on that April date, and it was a good five to six hours of discussions. Um, the, the conversations were, were, were unique and they were cool, and having done 10 of these, I can tell you that many communities share a lot of concerns, but also many communities, you hear the uniqueness of each community brought out in these MVP planning sessions. So, Brief intro to climate change. Um, again, we're going back to the prescriptive process that the Commonwealth of Mass um, decided for this particular program. So climate change is really three things. It's, it's, it's raising temperature, rising temperature, it's changes in precipitation, <coughs> and it's sea level rise. And Sherburn only has to worry about two of those. So back to the support given to these communities in order to make this program consistent from one community to the next. The Commonwealth um, also contracted with the Northeast Climate Change Center in order to <coughs> look at climate change impacts throughout the Commonwealth. There's always been data out there. The data has more or less stayed the same, but they wanted to apply consistency amongst the communities. They wanted communities to look at the same data source when it came to um, identifying and um, projecting what those impacts might be. So I didn't bring it with me, but I got a three ring binder that's about two inches thick that contains all of this data. Um, so instead of you guys having to go into the weeds, I did. And I pulled out what I thought was relevant to the discussion. What does a community need to know? So these data sets drill down into the watersheds. Instead of the Commonwealth of Mass, this is the issue. This is the concern within the Charles River watershed where Sherburn's located. So you're looking at average changes in temperature, um, projected cha changes of temperature. And we're starting with a 1971 baseline um, to 2000. So that's already 18 years old. So it's showing you, if you look at, I like looking at the second line, the annual days with maximum temperature over 90. In town, it's about nine days a year. If you start looking across at the projected increases, by the 2090s, on the low side, those days will increase by 15 or as much as 75. And in the report, it identifies the reason for this discrepancy. It's based on estimations of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So the more reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the more you're going to see that lower number play out. The, the greater increase in it, the higher number is what's projected to, to play out. And also note on the, quick, go ahead, sure. The projected changes in the 30s, 50s, 70s, and 90s are all against the baseline. They're all against the baseline. It's not against the previous time slot, right? Correct, it's okay. against that baseline, yep. Okay. And um, the other, on the lower chart there, you're looking at how much warmer you are getting. So right now you're about five days a year below zero. Um, those numbers of days, days are going to reduce. And what you're not seeing, but the workshop participants saw this, there was some significant discussions about what does this mean to a community when, when, when things get warmer when you know you have residents especially elderly residents or, or other residents at risk that may not have air conditioning um that's going to change that need for air conditioning when you have a power outage in a summer storm and you've got long long time it's, it's super hot air conditioning again becomes important so again there's consequences to quality of life you look at crops and agricultural operations 
warmer days are going to affect the kinds of crops that are grown. It's going to affect the growing season. And it's also going to affect, you know, there, there's a lot of horse farms in the community, and I'm sure horse farmers are well aware of what those, that heat might do. So then the other thing we looked at, based on the projections, was changing precipitation. So the total increase in preci precipitation isn't as significant as the fact that this changing precipitation is more of a reflection in changes of the types of storms you're getting. Um, storms are becoming more, f more intense. There, there's more rainfall in a given storm. There's more energy in a given storm. And they're becoming, they're spaced further apart. So it's, it's great to have a consistency in your weather pattern, but what we're seeing now is that spacing far apart is what encourages the drought situations. So in between those more intense rainstorms in the summertime, you, you increase the risk of drought. Again, another effect on crops, another impact on you know, water supplies, another impact on even agricult more agricultural operations. And another impact on, the other thing we talked a lot about was ticks and other illnesses associated with this changing dynamic. The tick season is longer, ticks aren't dying off, there's other pests that are coming in that are affecting um, trees and crops. So it's more than just it's going to be wetter at certain times or it's going to be hotter. So. Um, <coughs> This is the background that served the discussion when the group then began discussing for several hours. So how do we think this is going to affect residents and other operations in Sherbin? Can I ask you a question about the data? Sure. The data since that seems yep. to be the are these means? Is that what you're looking at? Oh, God, you're asking. I'm building. I think so. I'm taking the scientific so data. The, you know, the ranges or anything like that? Or I don't, but I can, I can send you that detailed report. There's a detailed scientific report that supports all this. If, if you want me to, I'll, yeah, I'll just, get, it's, it's get you the link. Yeah. This or the other thing means yeah. If you don't know. This so is the basis. Base, base sure. And the state wanted this data used as the basis for telling that story. More of, you know, this is what we're projecting based on the scientific data and other research that's out this, there. This may be too deep into the statistical weeds, but is there a confidence in uh, incidence brief ratio for those projections? Yes, when I read the report, again, all of this aligns with all of the other data and reporting that's been going on. So none of this is an outlier. I think it was an attempt by the Commonwealth to have one data source to go to. And it, it's not telling a story that's any different than most of the other reports out there that have these, these impacts projected as a result of climate change. Do you know what the confidence interval is for? I do not. Yes. Last time I checked, the, the uh, conservation commissions across the state were divided over what precipitation figures they should use for stormwater designs. And I understood that DEP was going to sort through that and come out with either sticking to the old precipitation rate or go to a new precipitation rate. And that was maybe a year ago, the last time I <coughs> got involved in that. Has DEP taken a position today to increase precipitation rates? So I think you're talking as to what the standards were in the state stormwater handbook. Is, are you referring yeah, back to that? that? Okay. That. I'm not aware that they have finalized that yet. Are, Do I have to come up there and speak? You may. It, uh, Kevin would know that answer is a... So when we uh, do stormwater design, there's sort of two parts to it. There's the pre and post, um, which um, we're using published rates for. And again, as long as you're using the same rainfall and existing as proposed, you can do, get a very good handle on, you know, e are you increasing your peak runoff, which is one of those requirements in the stormwater handbook. The other number would be to like size culverts and pipes and stormwater infrastructure like that. Uh, as a firm, we've been using, I call them the Cornell rates because they're on uh, Cornell's website. And those rates are higher uh, than what has been typically published and that's what we've been using at least. But I'm not aware that DEP has come out with a, a plank and guidance on, in the last year at least uh, about what storm wants to use. So that means they're still using the old standard. 
I think they are because that I, I'm still doing a lot of MS4 work, and that's a, that's a major discussion as to the MS4 requirements do not necessarily reflect the state stormwater handbook, and it's creating some confusion right now. The MS4 requirements are a little bit greater than what the state handbook is, and Fred Sivian at MassDP continues to dis to talk about the fact that they've been looking at updating that handbook. But wouldn't it make sense? I mean, all of us, like in a town like Sherburne, have to deal with culverts, culvert size, and all that kind of stuff. If what you're projecting here is anywhere close to being true, then we are making design decisions erroneously now because we're not, we're not planning Sure. This. Hopefully your consultants are taking into account, because, I mean, this is real-world stuff. This is not... and. The governor has issued that all state-funded projects, design projects, you know, he's embedded climate change impacts throughout his the whole state operation. So if you're working with MassDOT now, I can't tell you what standards they're using, but I know that they're required by the governor's office and others to take into account climate change impacts within their design standards and even siting of projects. So don't see any opposition to that. I mean, Eric, you might. You can also, um, Franny always put it in regulations, we put the standard we want, which is just three of them that are kind of out there. And we put the middle one in there, which is uh, more conservative than the uh, NOAA standard that's kind of been used in the past. You know, so if you're sure if we want to actually control it here in Sherman, we can actually just put it in our regulations. You have to adhere to it. Except for these. Another question? Um, as you mentioned, these the observed baseline numbers are 18 years old. How have those changed? Do you know any have any idea how they've changed since? I don't know how they've changed, but I know that when I would point out they were 18 years, I it took my first MVP workshop. Someone said, "Wow, we've got more hot days than what is on this chart from the past one there." Um, and um, I said, "Yeah, because it's 20 year old information." So are they going to update that? I don't think so. I think they're going to stay. I, don't, I think, I mean, this costs, I'm sure, a lot of money. So it, it, this is, like when we were in the training, it was, it was told over and over, these are projections. These are the baselines you want to tell your stories from, you want to take your plans from. It's not meant to be exact. It's not, it's not even um, um, a forecast. It's a projection based on things that may or may not happen. But I will send the link to the report. So what I handed out tonight and electronically the town has and it's already been submitted to the Commonwealth is a copy of the summary of findings, which is what came out of that workshop process. And one of the first things in the workshop a community was asked to do, there's a number of climate change hazards and within your community, what, what does climate change mean to you? What, what, what is Sherburne most concerned with? And this, this group identified flooding and precipitation, storm events, especially storm events that included wind, drought, and extreme temperatures. So those were the four, the four hazards that moved the discussion forward during the rest of the day. I have pictures here. I forgot about that. Okay, so I'm going to briefly go over the summary of findings and then Gino and other core team members are going to talk about the priorities that came out of that discussion. So what hit hard were your culverts and bridges and the concerns from your CDM director about whether or not they were designed appropriately for current events, whether they'd been maintained properly over the years, a whole bunch of things that he felt there were issues with respect to a major storm would, would damage them even further or an additional flooding would occur. So culverts and bridges became a number one item. Um, beavers. And I was surprised at how many th communities have beaver problems. <laughs> and there's some beaver issues as well. And they do provide that unpredictable flood risk. And um, unlike you know the rest of us who want to build stuff, they don't get permits. And they can do it wherever they want to do it. So, so the, 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 the beavers and where they choose to build their dams contributed to the potential flooding issues. Um, your drinking water supply. Um, there was a thought that it may be an insufficient supply if there were an extended drought. 
um, hazardous materials transport. You have um, rail that comes through town as well as vehicles that might be transporting hazardous materials. If you had a climate change related flood event, wind event, um, trees down. Um, emergency management was concerned. We don't necessarily know what's in those trucks if an accident occurs. Um, septic <coughs> systems, Title Fives don't always work in flood situations and they may not work also in long-term drought situations. So if you have um, issues with respect to Title V, you know, either seepage or not doing what it's supposed to do, those are other issues. Um, we talked a lot about the campus center here. Um, there's been a long-term need to identify opportunities to get a public water supply or um, wastewater, maybe a um, community septic system located here, but that became part of the discussion. And then roads, um, in the absence of culverts working properly, um, washouts and other issues, um, extreme temperatures can create the potholes that you saw with the winter storm events. You've got the ice and the snow, ice, snow and rain. So those are what ended up on the table with respect to um, the infrastructure. And then um, environmental concerns, water conservation, Trees and forests, um, I worked in several communities and that was talked about here as well. And in an extended drought period, you've got the, a, a significantly increased risk of forest fire. Um, open space, open space is a great way to manage, especially flood related events, open space is a great way to manage temperature. Um, so actually that's something that is a, is a positive for the town. I remember um, that discussion occurring that there's significant open space that can be used as a resource when it comes to climate change. And then the invasive species, economic and environmental damage. Um, if you were, had a farmer growing crops, those species, you know, the, those particular critters, pests or whatever could destroy the crop. Um, I was just noting on a news show last night that there's a certain section of central mass that is still being inundated by the gypsy moth and the public works director was contributing the changes in temperature to him not being able to get it to move out. Back to pest and disease control, ticks and mosquitoes. Um, the warmer weather in the summertime doesn't allow for the ticks in particular to die off. Um, stranding of commuters. Um, there was talk about how when floods occur, certain roads could potentially become impassable. So you might have folks stranded and surrounded by water. Vulnerable populations. What are you gonna do about seniors who with wind effects of power outages, with um, flooding effects. Do you know who they are? Do, do, do you know the resources that they might need? And then back to the agricultural impacts. Um, I don't know, do we have maple sugaring in town? Okay, so, so as noted, the, the town has a lot of strengths. <laughs> so, you, you own a town-owned forest reservation. You have control over a forest management plan there that could help mitigate wildfire risk. Um, again, back to there's a open space and recreation land available in town. I mean, that, that helps protect against climate change risks. And when we talk a little bit later about um, green infrastructure being used instead of hard infrastructure, your culverts, bridges, those are great points to divert <coughs> excess stormwater flows and reduce flooding. Um, you, you know how to plan for things. There's a lot of planning documents already in place. So, so as a community coming together to recognize this particular threat and doing something in response to it, that's not new to Sherborne. Um, small town identity, that the volunteers, the folks that showed up at this workshop, they were all volunteers. They had a lot to talk about. Um, emergency management, which does kind of overlay this. It's still separate and unique, but emergency management is, is, is part of this whole response plan. It's robust, it's strong. Um, I've been in some communities that don't have an emergency management plan. In fact, this latest round of MVP grants requires any new community to have an emergency management plan in order to do this. Um, your staff and volunteers, they know a lot. Um, I don't have the maps with me, but there's another report I can send you, and I think you have a Gino that I took pictures of. The markups on the maps, folks were enthusiastically contributing to s discussions looking at a town map as a storyboard. Um, you do have a Council on Aging that does maintain a list of elderly residents for notification, but we did talk about 
some of that invisible population. Not everybody likes to be known as someone in need. And then um, Eversource was, was looked at as a partner, as a strength. They have been doing what they can in order to minimize power outages and do the tree pruning necessary. So I'm gonna turn this over to Gino now and others to talk about um, what the recommendations were that came out of this. And you can talk and then we'll conclude with some more discussion and some opportunities to potentially find some funding assistance for some of these priorities. So as you can see, the, the, uh, the recommendations relate closely to the concerns that were just reviewed uh, previously, including the first one, conducting a comprehensive study of water resources, uh, including as they relate to culverts and bridges and their capacity for handling uh, stormwater, uh, comprehensive plan for beaver management, uh, eligibility for Mass Dots Municipal Small Bridge Program may be a source of funding and again being part of this gives us extra points on any state grant program. Uh, reviewing and revising town <coughs> regulations as was discussed previously we may need to update uh, stormwater management regulations and the, the design storms that we we would use to evaluate. Um, implementing forest management plans these were the highest priority uh, uh, actions that were identified at the workshop. Then we moved to the, uh, the moderate and lower priority actions, which were uh, transportation resiliency planning, always acquiring new open space as a, as a priority, green infrastructure opportunities, uh, invasive species management, hazardous materials risk, and continuing to always improve the communication system, which the most recent thing, and Chief Kinney can um, um, maybe weigh in on this too, but I know the new cell tower off Lake Street is helping with that. Uh, farm pond management plan, which is already in, in existence. Uh, outreach strategy, again, Council on Aging has, has uh, a lot of that in place already. Uh, expand support for a community center, planning to support the agricultural community. We just adopted a bylaw that uh, will help the uh, economic viability of farms, hopefully. Maintaining small town culture has always been a priority here. And uh, conducting public outreach on impacts of climate change. So we do expect, I know that uh, both uh, Sean Colleen and Chief Thompson are at uh, public safety committee meeting and they expect to be here shortly. They could, ha they could weigh in on some of these priorities as well, but um, we also would like to open it up for comments and discussion here. Um, so, so one, uh, I guess, advantage we have or, or these characteristics we have which I didn't see addressed in there is we are surrounded by larger communities. So th this report looks like it's set up with Sherburn as an island and we have to be self-sufficient but I think we're in a pretty good position in the sense that we're in a very populated area. We're not out in the middle of the desert. We're not out in the middle of some island someplace. Um, and I just wanted to know if, if those considerations were, were, were part of this, and I think some of these strategies need to be coordinated with abutting municipalities. And I, I just I, I said this to somebody when I came in, but I just spent 20 minutes in a, in a detour because Native blocked Route 16 before the Sherburn Town Line, didn't tell anybody about it, didn't put a sign further back down, and just routed hundreds of cars onto um, Everett Street, creating an enormous backup, which I'm not even positive our public safety people were aware of. So I think, you know, having good communications and coordinating with <laughs> somebody in cities and towns really should be part of this whole strategy. Absolutely, and that, that was discussed at the workshop, particularly in terms of um, reaching hospitals if, if roads are impacted. And uh, again, we do have mutual aid agreements with surrounding towns to, um, to uh, assist, but 
more regional cooperation certainly is would be. Uh, uh, All our food sources are in the budding. That was brought up. That, yeah. That's the part I remember is that even though you, there was a sense of self self sufficiency, like but <laughs> yeah, in, in some of the roads that are the access roads to the grocery stores yeah. were potentially at risk during a storm event. So Absolutely. while you know those neighboring communities are both a, a um, an opportunity and a challenge, but um, and also keep in mind, if I didn't say this earlier, this is a living, breathing document. That's why we're having this hearing. The state's mm -hmm. going to ask you to revisit in a, in a year. So this is not concluded. This is the beginning of the discussion. So. In the action plan, where does, is it under the transportation resiliency planning or what, where with the public safety, we've talked about the different tree regulations and the fact that it takes so long sometimes to take down dangerous trees in this town. Where would that fall in? Because like you said, if we have a big storm and what we see, we've seen what happens in this town with the trees that we aren't able to take down, um, where does that fall in these priorities? We could put that under the review and revise town regulations. If you wanted to um, develop and adopt a new regulation, um, yeah, I think it's important. Determining a timeline for tree removal. For tree removal, well, it's the the tree removal plan, and I don't know, Sean, maybe you can help with this, but it's, it's we're talking about like public safety versus. I know the public planning board goes through how many meetings to get rid of trees or recommended trees to get rid of. Yeah, we have an Amherst first hearing, and we have a, a town tree How many did you have this spring? Continued to hear. We have one hearing, but it was continued. Four times. Four times. Right. So is this for town-owned trees or private property trees or trees in the Yeah, this right is for right? town shade trees. Town shade trees, okay. Um, Paul? Just a comment about the Charles River. As you probably know, I, I own about a mile of the Charles River and constantly have all kinds of engagement there. When there's floods, there's an amazing resilience. I can have 20 acres under water, and then it will drain gradually. So if, if there's a threat of a flood, it just covers pasture, and then it recedes. And similarly, when there's a drought, when we've, we've had a drought. The cows go to Medfield. The cows, we're, we're able to walk Sorry, over to Medfield. Yeah. <laughs> That my cattle will walk across the river. We have the old ford uh, that was from the 16th century. So there's a, a shallow area you can walk across and drop without getting your shoes too wet. The, the cows can figure out where that is and they'll go right over to Memphis. But the res river is amazingly resilient, is the point of all this. Particularly, particularly there with the Medfield Flats. It's just yeah. a huge right. It can expand right. and contract. It's 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 almost like breathing. So to the extent that there's a, a water challenge, it like takes a deep breath. Yep. And then when there's a drought, it's like it it, it exhales. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 self protecting. It, it's an amazing thing to watch. And of course, the Corps of Engineers had the foresight 30 or 40 years ago to develop the Charles River Natural Valley storage area to do just that. But um, it could certainly use to be expanded as there are other areas that are vulnerable to flooding that um, if they're set aside to serve as a buffer area, as you're describing, would um, go a long way to mitigating those, those big storms. Uh, so, um, yeah. Gina, remind me, we have, we have a stormwater regulation, right? Yes, we do. I don't know, actually, put in a review of um, revised regulation, a sub bullet, to at least review the um, current precipitation standard. That we, if that could, if we could revise the regulation to actually um, you know, update the precipitation standard in there, then we can actually put what we require in there, sure. even if the master uh, install or one doesn't keep up. The other side comment I had is I'll agree 100% about culverts. That's the uh, the forgotten infrastructure in almost every community I know of. Because it's not a bridge, so it doesn't go into mass DOT inspections. And it's not really a stormwater feature. You know, it's actually more of a roadway feature than a stormwater feature. And because um, you can face natural water bodies. 
So that's something where um, they're just under inspected everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the positives for a community that is an MVP is there's a few culvert funding programs out there. They're not a whole lot of money. They're very restrictive. You have the Department of Environmental Resources, DER. Um, they actually have a culvert funding program. Um, and if you are an MVP community, you get enhanced access to funding through that program. But you need to have a culvert that fits the criteria that will be. Yeah, the National Steel Water Bank. Yeah. It starts an $80,000 culvert to an $800,000 culvert. Yeah, I heard about that in the community in Beck Beckett out in Western Mass. Um, yes. So, um, so, but what in particular was brought up when you mentioned the Charles River is, is that's, that's an, a, a great reference to how green infrastructure can be used to, to, uh, to affect and reduce flooding impacts. And in any future grant program, the MVP Action Grant, the grant requirements require a community to look at green infrastructure solutions first before they go into the gray built environment. <laughs> Chief? I think we discussed the flooding and water issues too. Um, talking about that, there was more around having those intense storms and dealing with flash flooding. Flash flooding, flash flooding for possible erosion of homes, <coughs> washouts, washouts and roads and things like that. Where I think those areas we, we do have some areas of contention concern. Mm -hmm. um, and areas in some of the creeks and brooks that could potentially create that. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, Lake Street, where I haven't been here to witness it, but there have been times where water has been up on the edge of the road, over the road. And I have been here for, I believe it's, uh, it's We brought up the. So what I'll do, because the, the, the detailed report, these are just bullets from there, does include some of those more specific locations. And I'll, I'll send it out to everyone who is on the core team and the MVP workshop. I have their email addresses. And you can all get a copy of that. And if, if there's a, spe a specific location that we didn't pick up at the MVP workshop, we can add that to the report. But I just pulled bullets out of that. Um, but yeah, the flash floods, the, the flooding was identified as a hazard. I had one other question. Before. Sure. Yeah, um, are there any privately owned uh, stormwater systems, like on a homeowner association, or on private roads, or maybe proposed on some of these 40Bs? Is there anything? Yes. So, I mean, I don't know if those have. We just dropped them. <laughs> but if anything private, another issue that's coming up in a lot of places is. Um, there's always these um, maintenance requirements in like the home association or any kind of planning board decision that are never adhered to. <coughs> That's something I, I would encourage, even on a high, put on a high priority, that the town assess the compliance with the uh, maintenance requirements because they do eventually fail. Um, there are some communities in down south where the uh, cities just want to taking them over because no one was doing it, and uh, they'll fail pretty rapidly, especially if they have recharge systems in them. So if you take it over and then you assess it back. So I think that discussion came up about, but I, if I recall right, I remember sitting over there with that, my group talking about that, and I think one of the issues that came up, um, and it's a challenge in every community, is access to those um, stormwater operations in the absence of any sort of um, legal authority. To make them make do sure things. Well, the goals of the city, our town, not to access them, you know, but you wind up doing it. Yeah. Because homeowners just they, you know, they never keep on top of them, and they eventually fail. And when they fail, now all of a sudden, no one cares. Mm -hmm. I think what it might have been breaks. brought up in the meeting was uh, we have a lot of outfalls that are on private property, and a lot of them were at least pre seventies, and even the ones in the seventies. We're mapping them now, but 
not too many of them have I found the legal easements for them. Uh, okay. And you're doing that as part of the MS4? Yeah. Are you, are you but it's pretty limited in town what we've had to map for the MS4 so far. But, but I, there's critical ones I've had to go out and chase. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that, we were right. jetting them. Okay. Uh, and you, you find yourself asking for permission on the people's property uh, to go try to find the end of the pipe. Right. Yeah, there there are no, to my recollection, there are no subdivisions with homeowners associations maintaining stormwater management systems. Well, that's not not a subdivision, but yeah, but it ties into the town system. Oh well, no, it does have the detention basin. No, that, that's right. That's right. Um, and the road we just adopted had one. Road no, Chris, no, Chris Lane. Right. Um, yeah, and the, um, the Walgreens yeah. building, which I, uh, th but that ties into the town system. And I imagine the older developed uh, commercial properties do all tie into the town, town system. Yeah. local authority to do that right now to make that developers some developments groundwater recharge is a requirement of the stormwater handbook on any development project. Yeah, the, yeah, it, it, is. Is. it just might be like in an infiltration system under the parking lot. That's right. not in an open I'm thinking of the sort of principles that are uh, advertised in low impact design. Where there's a lot more done than just catching stormwater. Uh, there's a lot of you know, local recharge through green spaces and mm -hmm. swales and all kinds of trips that can be. So, one of the, and again, there, there's been no project identified yet, but one of the two of the previously funded MVP action grants that we worked on in other communities could address that. If you go with an integrated water management plan. Your deliverables could include specific opportunities for stormwater BMPs and low impact development options that actually reflect your town's needs and opportunities. So it's not just, here's a whole book binder full of pick one, but w uh, an integrated water management plan can actually get very specific because of soils, because of topography, because of a whole lot of things. In this area, this is one that we'd like to see you use because we know it works and it works best. And you would also tie it to Sean's challenge with the MS4 permit um, because he's, he's got some targeted pollutants that the town's going to need to take care of and address when it comes to meeting their MS4 permit requirements that your climate change work can actually support. But yeah, that's, that's a great issue. It's not just a handbook full of pick one, but what really works. Mm. One of your moderate recommendations was to develop a more robust communication system. And the town in the last place is a question for Chief Kenny and Sean. The, the, the town over the last several years has invested a fair amount of money and effort in completing the cell tower, updating communications equipment. What 
what else do we need to be doing? I mean, I, I was a little surprised to see that as a bullet point. What, what do we need to do to kind of more robust communication centers? Right now, the, the hazard that we face on product we face when we look at the storms and the intensity of storms is if one of our repeater sites goes down, we will in effect be left uh, with a large area that's on the product we won't have the ability to communicate. Um, we have right now the contingency plan for that is to use uh, mass fire district 14 against portable repeaters that we can for the Iraq, same thing as the portable was the year established. Um, but that's, you know, that's like putting a band-aid on something. So we, I'm, one of the things that I'm working on is trying to trying to evaluate, you know, we have the two sites with repeaters, and that's their vital to the communication. So uh, with the two sites, maybe having them set up to where there's some redundancy built in, where we can, like right now, if we lose one, we lose both, instead of it being you know, you lose one, you still have the capability of the other link. So if one goes down, you kind of lose the functionality. Um, so uh, one of the things I'm looking at in terms of, you know, evaluating risk and management of that is to try to use what we have and maybe, you know, maybe look at purchasing a gateway or a mobile computer that we would have that would be deployable or usable, um, not only in the event of a catastrophic failure, but also, you know, if we have a, a significant event, we can, you know, possibly provide that kind of video service on site or patch ourselves into a robust network that exists like the Mass Fire District 14 and the Mass Mutual uh, system, which just requires phone call and asking permission. So, um, those are the kind of things I'm looking at, you know, they can range project, you know, from the smallest or simplest being 10,000 and north to be hundreds of thousands. So obviously I'm looking at the, the ones that can fix it for the least amount of money. Because um, I don't think we necessarily need to go to a, you know, an enormous full-fledged, uh, you know, redundant or secondary system. I think we just need to make what we have work and make sure that, you know, generators in the back of power and everything are in place. Um, but like I said, if we get one of those T1 lines, uh, Just something I just thought of is the person who always gets stuck between the developer and the uh, municipality. Um, your stormwater bylaw, does that require you guys to go to conservation or is that through your planning board? Planning board. Okay. Um, but conservation has their own regulations too for, for stormwater. stormwater. Yes. Okay. So you could very well, and I, maybe you guys are already doing this, but include in either the conditions, right, that you require easements for any sort of, you were talking about stormwater, yeah. For stuff that's already, you know, been installed, fine. That's a different story. But obviously, everything moving forward, you can require easements. And I don't know if you guys would consider like uh, requiring a bond for long-term stormwater maintenance, so that in a situation where you have, whether it's the homeowners association, whoever the applicant is, they are on the hook, and there is money set aside to address some of those maintenance concerns. Just don't tell any of my development clients that. Mm -hmm. so, just so Absolutely. what I have here, not, um, but great conversation. I've I've taken notes, but I'm also going to leave behind some comment sheets. So as you think about this, um, Gino, you're the person that would be they'd be sending them to, and you'd send yeah. them to me. But any additional thoughts that you wanted to articulate or repeat what I took in my notes here, I'll be leaving those behind. Um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to stick with the schedule, <laughs> so I don't want to. So if there's not more discussion about this, I can bring this to a conclusion, if that's OK. So and it's a great conclusion. It's actually a new beginning. Um, so EEA is projecting that they are going to have a new round of MVP action grant funding in July. And those of you who are at the workshop, we talked about that because it had just come out, but you weren't in a position on the schedule to have a plan ready yet. So. If it's going to be in July, you're still within that initial first group of funded communities. So your, your, your competition is, is limited. Only MVP communities can apply for this funding assistance. And as noted, the last round was $3 million. 
and um, they were projecting this next round to be another three million. So I will stay alert to when that RFR hits the streets. I will stay chatting with Gino, and then we will have a discussion then. You, you saw your priorities. Um, what is that priority that you would be looking for funding assistance to move forward on? And we'll help you put together an application, and um, you could have another project in the next two or three months. I think the one that supports everything else, the one that gives you that better picture of really what's going on, in, and that's what many other communities went for, is an additional vulnerability assessment that focuses on your culverts, your bridges, even what are the beavers doing to impact this, so that you have a, a better understanding of what's going on with your hard infrastructure, where you have opportunities to take advantage, like the Charles River, um, to use green infrastructure for a solution, because that solves a whole lot of problems, not just flooding, but water quality issues. And then actually developing some conceptual designs and others that, and other elements that can help move you forward quickly to actually begin correcting these problems. So. So you would kind of essentially have labor and kind for money, so you basically have People sign, yeah, and they're very, the last round, which was also the first round, they were very generous with what you could call in-kind services, so, yeah. Thanks for this, good work. Thank you, this is, Mary, this is great, thanks, Gino. Do we want? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have one, one, one thing that's in the high priority is, is eligibility for the DOT small bridge program. That's right. in addition to, that's not. Uh, and it, in addition to, right, and so, you know, we would talk to Sean about, you know, the bridges that fit the sweet spot is anywhere from 10 to 20 foot span, um, but being an MVP community, and if you do an initial assessment, you'll have a better understanding, better application, and you get more points because you're an MVP community. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, hey, thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. What town were you with? No, town I was in the administration. No, I just joined the ward in January. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I just copied it, and that's your copy now. So oh, okay. So uh, for Windy Low Trask, do you want Dave to set that up? We'll we'll um, we're doing that now? Yeah, that's the next one on the agenda. Great. Is, is anybody here from Paris? No. Uh, it's just going to be a general conversation. Yeah. Okay. Sure, let Dave set it up. Sure. <laughs> Have you been to the new facilities for the MIT Urban Planning Group? It's right to the left of the uh, main stairs. Yeah. It's it's nice space. It was always there, but it, was it didn't okay. look like that. It was beautiful. Yeah. I was there a couple years ago. I was impressed. And some of the MIT buildings are pretty run down. And oh, yeah. I mean, no, that was a new renovation. I think. <clears throat> so what happened to David? Hey, do you know who David is? I think that's what I understood him to say. True. We'll just skip and go to Marianne yeah. first. Yeah, okay. Marianne, we're going to take the open space and rec plan and the general plan out of order because um, 
Dave is uh, detained right now. So uh, the next item on the agenda is an update on a couple of planning items, the open space and recreation plan and the general plan. And Marianne, are you going to be discussing both of those? Yes. Terrific. Thank you. No. Please. Well, I requested a spot on your agenda tonight because uh, you haven't heard about the general plan for a while. Uh, but uh, the planning board's been working on it pretty much nonstop. Uh, and it's coming together. And I brought, um, I wanted you to know that the first sections have been sent to the uh, layout and editor that you guys approved money for. And I thought you should see an example of his work um, so that I can also send this to you obviously but this is now yeah this that I sent you is in the email right so it's in color it's in color and since the last one was done quite a while ago and we didn't have the computer use that we have now um, I think you have copy for that so Which picture are we looking at? This you know that that is it's the um, in the works. The cover sheet is draft general yeah, plan organization, and right. the next page is the natural resources and open space. Great. Yes, actually, the next yeah the next page page is just one section of the general plan, and I'm giving it to you just as an illustration of how the plan's going to look. Um, and at the end of the and the end of this document, uh, there's a table which is part of the implementation tables that will be all at the end of the whole general plan I know that when we've discussed this before you were concerned about okay so this plan go on the shelf and how do we know if anything actually gets done uh, I just wanted you to see the kind of implementation table that we're putting together um, it will allow us I mean it's, it's in great detail it's actually rather boring reading but <laughs> it, it does allow us to go back once a year and see actually what is moving forward and what's and and to remind ourselves of what <coughs> we've been to do so that's the update on the general plan and i will talk about the open space and recreation plan too but maybe you have questions about the general oh, plan. i had i had one but I, go oh. ahead. the uh plan looks beautiful it's my first comment. My second comment is that the natural resources and open space provisions are probably the least controversial part of any plan. So it's one that we can all look at and feel good about, particularly a community like Sherburne with wonderful natural resources and much more open space than most communities. The part of the plan that of of great interest to me and I think to most people in the town is going to be the town center section and the housing section and so when I got this the first thing I did was to try to go find those sections went through all the pages and got to the end this is just an illustrated <laughs> illustration of how it's going to look uh, there's a reason that the natural resources and open space section was done first, was finished first. Uh, the town center section is almost finished. And when it is finished, we'll be sending you a, a, a file much like this to take a look at it. So um, how, how are we going to be proceeding going forward? So, so there's all of these sections, recreation, cultural resources, circulation all of these sections ultimately you're going to have town meeting vote this no town meeting is vote is not required for a general plan the only vote that's actually required is the planning board adoption I, of the plan i, I understand but obviously Some we want buy-in i think it's not uh we, we've discussed this at planning board and i think uh the planning board members here would agree that we feel it's just not feasible to take it up for a vote at town meeting. There's so much detail. And 
it's sort of asking for, you know, some small point to be contested in it, and there are plenty of things that could be contested. So, what I've uh, seen on that point, if I could, is that some communities use town meetings as a way to to get buy-in on the plan. So, if you, if you're not going to opt for a town meeting vote, could I suggest that we have set up a town meeting an opportunity for like a, a recess and then a a full presentation of the plan. So this is going to be a, a planning board plan. I think it's under section D of what, 81D or something like that. Um, but in terms of, of other boards and committees having input, are we going to, uh, we're just going to get different chapters uh, you're going to you're going to see the entire plan and i must say that we've been uh feeding these sections out all along to the relevant boards and committees for example this has gone to conservation board of health open space the water commissioner the town center options committee uh and uh, the recreation commission the agricultural commission we have had a a lot of input all along and we'll continue to get that input once we have what we think is a semi-final text it goes back and that's exactly what we're doing with this right now well i'm just trying to figure out the role of the board of selectmen in your in your time schedule so we've we, we've had one section which i it was a delight to read by the way when does the Board of Selectmen next see something, or, or next time we have a meeting like this, or will there ever be? L let us ask you, how would you like to see the plan? Would you like to wait until all the text is in place and review the whole thing, or would you like to see sections as they're finished? What's your preference? I have a slight preference for sections just because there's a lot of material in here. The mm -hmm. I would echo what Paul said. The open space and recreation and natural resources and open space are terrific but there's a lot of detail in here um, and I, what's what's the sense of the board what, what do other people think uh, either way is fine with me I would be somewhat sensitive um, if members have have comments because I know I mean this was started this was like two years into it when I left the board <laughs> years ago so it's, it's been a lot of thought into it and I'm not saying we shouldn't have comments but acknowledge that you know if you do want to have a very major input to it all their meetings are actually open meetings and people can go and they can actually provide input I think I still provide input on some of the financial section mm -hmm. yeah. so be um I guess be sensitive to that and then boy if you have if you have questions you can ask and so on be sensitive to major type comments if you think you're gonna have a major comment I would engage in them at, at, as soon as possible yeah thank you Eric I, I do appreciate that because uh, we're getting comments all along and at this point uh, the, it's not so helpful to I mean typos are good to get corrected but the editor gets that and we catch them too uh, it's what we're looking for if if you want to give us feedback is uh, issues like major uh, errors in fact Chuck gave me one tonight. It's very helpful. I fixed it already, Chuck. Uh, or omissions, things that you think should be there and aren't there. Mm -hmm. So I think sending it section by section, once we're happy with the text, is good. Um, Mostly we want to get you to brag. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, we've ha we have hearings. We've had hearings on major sections. Yeah. So I don't want to reopen those hearings. No. So, I mean, we've had hearings and with a lot of feedback. Um, and as Marion mentioned, they've gone to boards and committees and we're continuing, we're still doing that. Um, I'm on the agenda for next month's traffic safety um, to talk about circulation. So, so it's ongoing and we're working on it. We want to get it to you. We're, I, I'm the one that was hopelessly optimistic about how we'd simply edit the old one. And, and um, uh, this, this is a much, much more inclusive and better process than what we launched uh, and drafting by committee is tough I've got some very minor typos that I'll give you you're welcome to ignore them yeah. use them but um, the only thing I was looking for was something that I thought was incorrect and that's the thing that we talked about before the meeting uh, 
Um, so so I, I think presenting it at town meeting is great. I love that. Mm -hmm. But, but um, the, the state specifically <laughs> enables the planning board to approve it only because, only because um, trying to weed through all this detail in all those different sections and deliberate in a meaningful way at town meeting is be, be prepared for a month long of meetings. Um, because that's about what our hearings have, have uh, result, resulted in. That's about how much time it's taken. I, I also w w want to add to that uh, the goals and recommendations and action, the kind of outline that you see within the section and in the implementation plan, those have been posted uh, for, most of them have been up for a year <laughs> on the town website. And that's, that train's kind of left the station. You know, at a certain point, we have to fish or cut bait. And uh, if, uh, so we're, uh, basically, I'm, I'm pleading with you uh, not to make uh, changes that aren't like really, you know, major, important changes uh, to that part of the plan because it uh, basically, it creates a, a tremendous amount of work. I think it, since I raised the issue, I, th I think I want to say two things. First, I didn't raise it because I had any changes. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more about the management of the board and our ability to digest stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's 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 like a meal, and I'm saying give us a a plate that we can eat as opposed to having a dump truck dump uh, uh, a year's worth of food on the table. And, and <laughs> you must be hungry, Paul. <laughs> I know you haven't been to no. <laughs> no, I would rather do it that way anyway. That's much better f for uh, for us as well as for you. So, so, so I'm, I'm understanding, I guess, that the plan is now not to bring this to town meeting to have it endorsed by the, the town meeting. I know for a couple of years we had talked about Well, I'd like to, to present that. it at town meeting, but holding up a finished document like this is your town plan that we have together been working on these past three and a half years. Um, but I think a debate at that point on points in the plan is uh, not going to be well, productive. Well, I, I, you know, the planning board, by the way, we posted our meeting tonight, so we're in session. But, um, and I see Addie May wants to speak. But we have talked about endorsement, which to me is different than, than a, a vote uh, of approval. You know, it, it, only in that if we wanted, if, if the idea is to present it, as they say, the way each section was presented in hearings, that's a lot different than saying, um, you know, we've already, we, we, in the, the last uh, planning board, the last general plan, they presented the guiding principles, effectively. That's what was presented at town meeting, nothing and, and else. And the goals. See, uh, I, I, mean, I, I, I just, I think there's value in having the town endorse a plan that's been adopted by the planning board. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think you open it up to debate, it, other than a debate in which some people might say, you know what, I think this is a terrible plan, I don't want to endorse it. In which case, you ought to hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean you have to believe it or that you can't, yeah. have a, can't have a plan. It would still be the town's plan if you adopt it. But I do think yeah. it's a stronger plan if the community as a whole says we acknowledge what you did and we think it's good. People are always going to have something yeah. to quibble with in a plan. But, but I, I think that I, I, socialization I within the town that. is important. I don't disagree with what you just said. Okay. Um, but the idea of having a, everyone at town meeting having a copy, it's not legislation. I'm not paying for that. Yeah, no, it's, and it's not legislation. <laughs> it doesn't have to be wordsmith at yeah, yeah. town meeting. Yeah. But, but before, before that happens, you know, we would like the board of select, the select board and other major boards to have already read it and yeah. endorse it so that we have that behind us. I, I think that's right. I mean, it's the, it's the culmination of that process. You've, right. you've voted it, other boards have, have approved right. it, and then you ask the town to give its endorsement. And then everybody is more bought into it. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. As long as we can differentiate that. Yeah. Eddie? So I just wanted to make one reference that the planning board did bring the goals and um, recommendations. It, in uh, all town meeting of 2017 and um, so we did present the goals and we did present the different sections and the, there were fears then that planning board was create and we had to remind everyone this is this, this is just vision this is just dreams and ideas and we're this is not law this is different so um, and the other thing is, is 
before I even came on planning board, this had been worked on with multiple working groups throughout town. So there's been, been a long, long process, um, and it's it's be nice to kind of get the document done. When I was when I was on planning board 20 years ago, we were working on a general plan too. So it seems like. 27 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Good. The other comment Thank I. Thank you. One other comment here that I'm working uh, with the uh, Baker Polito administration on a uh, land use bill that would give great weight to master plants so that uh, courts reviewing decisions would give enhanced protection to decisions that comply with a, a properly adopted community plan versus decisions that fly off the handle and are not consistent with the community's general plan. So up until now, a general plan has been something as a general guidance documents, but if some of these changes get enacted, this would become a very important document for the community going forward. Yeah, we're, we're aware of that bill, and we hope it passes uh, someday. It's, I know it's been in the works for a while, uh, and we're, we really uh, have that in mind as we wrote this plan. Open space. Open Terrific. Space. Any other questions on the on the board? No. Um, would ask you to stay for the next item on the agenda, which is a brief update uh, on um, the open space plan. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm not done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of dump trucks, <laughs> dumping a big document on you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's better. Um, I uh, I gave you uh, a a color uh, copy of the open space and recreation plan that's very close to being done. In fact, this uh, was requested ten days ago, and now it's even more complete. So bear in mind that this now is not the absolute final document, but it's close enough for you to take a look at it. And um, the open space and recreation plan. Uh, is a, a much more, say, lockstep plan. It has to have all of the elements in the right order as required by the state. It doesn't go to the same place as the state. It goes to uh, uh, Department of Conservation Services. Um, and all of the elements that you see in this plan are required. And you'll find that there is some repetition in it, but that's required repetition. So just bear that in mind. I. Um, I wanted you to see the plan as it now stands, just to get an idea of what it's going to look like. Um, and I will send you a Dropbox link to the absolute current plan, if you'd rather read it on your computers in the absolute, uh, absolute current version. Because uh, we're working on this all the time. So uh, since I had to give you these copies 10 days ago, um, there, there's been a lot of work done since then. So just to tell you that this is a good example of what we're doing, but it's not the absolute final. How close is it to being final? Where do you, um, on a percentage this basis? This is very close. We, we plan to send it to MAPC uh, at the end of the summer. We probably could do it earlier if I weren't going away, but I, I am going away. So. Uh, Right now, uh, in the version that's now online, there's only two small pieces missing. Uh, one of them is a table of properties that has to be at the end of the plan. They require a detailed table of all properties of conservation or recreation or municipal interest. Uh, uh, there's a summary of that in the plan, but the whole table isn't there. And the only other thing that's missing is um, there's a small piece of one of the appendices um, concerning uh, dis access for disabled individuals. Uh, one of the appendix 
appendices, which you actually have, and it's quite long, is a, uh, an analysis of all our recreational facilities in regard to their accessibility uh, according to ADA rules. Um, uh, David Williams has agreed to be the ADA coordinator, which is required in the plan, and you have designated him as such. Uh, the one piece that we still don't have is that uh, the town needs a, um, a, an appeal procedure by which people with disabilities can appeal to the town for better access wh wherever. Uh, we don't have an official appeal procedure, and I think uh, Gino tells me that to get that uh, in place would take a vote at town meeting. Is that correct? Well, to, to amend the, um, uh, well, actually, yeah. I guess it's, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be amending it because it's a personnel <coughs> policy. Uh, what we have so far is the is personnel nice. policy in regards to handicapped accessibility and accommodating persons with disabilities. Yeah, for employment. The, <coughs> yeah. Uh, the plan requires a grievance procedure for people who are attempting to use recreation facilities. And, I mean, generally, that would be if they have a complaint, they go to the town administrator. If they're not satisfied with that uh, outcome, then they appeal to the board of selectmen. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, so. Uh, I think it could be probably just adopted as a policy and not a bylaw. And then we could uh, mm -hmm. just include it into the plan. Yeah, we have to, we have to file a plan that's required. And we can't wait for annual town meeting. So that really leaves us no choice. And if somebody would write that up, then the board could adopt it. But on the issue of disability, I think I had this conversation maybe with you, Gino, that at a meeting at the State House, one of the grant awarding authorities came up to me and said that they want to give Sherburne some money so that we could have some trails in town. And when I wrote to the town to say, well, there's money available, why aren't we using it? The answer was, trails have to be ha handicapped or disability accessible. The whole point is that a trail is not a trail if we discriminate against the, the uh, handicap. So if we just have a natural path in the woods that has roots and, and uh, uh, rocks that you have to jump over and all of that, that discriminates, that doesn't count, the state doesn't want that. So that you have to actually put down a surface mm -hmm. that works for all the citizens of the town to have a trail network. So there's a, a whole weight of, of uh, considerations about being inclusive for a diverse uh, uh, constituency so that all people can get the benefit of these, these trail systems. And that's, not only is there state money available to help do that, but you have to have a process by which those people who feel excluded from these facilities have a right to be heard and to have their grievances addressed in, in, in some meaningful way. So there is state money out there, but we'd have to make the commitment to do more th with trails than just to cut a few branches out of the way and, and hack the... Uh, We've discussed this at length, and I, I, it, that's a good comment. We, we've taken it really seriously. The Disability Committee and uh, CONCOM and uh, Open Space Committee uh, has uh, discussed this and trying to put that together. I mean, it, it is uh, the nature of our trails is such that they're never going to be fully accessible. This is, uh, it's, it's a question of how you defined a, define a trail. If you're in Boston, a trail might be a paved or stone path somewhere. In Sherburne, that's not what a trail is. Do you want to mention the upper trail? Yes, I, I, I'm getting to that. <laughs> but the one thing we can do, and that uh, John is helping to drive uh, and seeking funds for, right, is to uh, extend the Upper Charles Rail Trail into Sherburne, right up to Whitney Street, 
and to use the easement and the land that the town has uh, along that Whit Whitney Farms development along the rail to make a good ADA accessible access uh, with a parking at Whitney, ADA accessible access to the rail trail that will go right up to Whitney Street. And that would give access to the entire rail trail from Sherburn through Holliston. And further plans are in the works to extend the rail trail north of uh, north of Whitney Street uh, to the Barber Reservation and into Framingham and uh, a, a team is working on that. Just to comment on that, I was part of the, the board that settled a lawsuit with the Whitney Farms development and as part of that settlement there was an agreement to provide us essentially with a parking lot mm -hmm. for that trail system. So. It, I don't, I don't know whether you all are aware of it, but we have the right to have a parking lot there. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, and conservation uh, made an agreement to formalize the, the, the just the, the exact track of the trail from the parking lot. Um, so that's been formally defined and <coughs> agreed to. Um, and we're, we've applied for some, uh, for some grant uh, money from a state program to make that trail an ADA compliant trail. Excellent. I have two comments on the plan. Uh, the first was quite an eyebrow raiser for me, where it's projected that Sherburn's population is going to drop significantly to uh, 3,600 people from our current population, which is 4,200. So that is huge. And I'm wondering, why do people think that the town of Sherburne is going to start losing residents at yeah, that I've, amount? I've That's on, on page, by the way, 7. Page 7, yes. I think uh, what we actually say there is that that was the Metropolitan Area Plan Planning Council forecast into the year 2030. Uh, but uh, if you read the rest of that paragraph, uh, we go on to say that that's unrealistic because we have these new housing developments and it's more likely to be up uh, significantly in 2030. At the end of the paragraph, we give some rough number, and I forget where that estimate comes from, but over 5,000 in 2030. My, my question was, why does MAPC think that the town of Sherburn, and what's their reasoning? What, what, what is it that they see? Uh, well, I, think I, that was a demo, I think that was a demographic analysis. We went through this yeah. a number of years ago. It was the same projection. This is, a, this is an old number from I don't know, whenever this it's was done. It's and, it, and it was mm -hmm. done based on demographic projections, age cohort, age cohort projections. You can see that there was right. a decrease between 2000 and 2010. Right. So they're probably basing it, that was the last mm -hmm. census. It was, it, was sure. age, it was age cohort based is yeah. what it was. They're losing 500 people in two That's years. That's right. Yeah. I mean, they don't say who the 500 people are either, so. <laughs> 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 but your point is a good one, Paul, because uh, perhaps it's just misleading to have that MAPC figure in there at all. Why, why, why include it, that whole paragraph in that chart? Well, I think one, one reason to include it is because it pushes back against MAPC, which made a, a projection that nobody in this room, I think, thinks is, is a particularly valid projection, yet it's still out there, and MAPC still has some authority over planning dollars and everything else. So I, I don't know why we wouldn't take issue with it if we think we should take issue with it. Give that back to Marion. The same yeah. number to deal with with the housing production plan when we were in the same conundrum and the consultant kept saying, well, these are the data sets that we have to work with. We have to use the charts that are being produced nationally. And even though it doesn't, kept saying, we agree. Sherburne's a small town. It's very quick to, you know, two little changes throw the whole data projection off. So it's really a challenge trying to use the regional planning material sometimes to mm -hmm. within the guidelines of what we actually have going on here. It's odd that one part of the state government doesn't agree with the other part of the state government. But it's not on you. <laughs> not on at all. It's not on you. That's exactly what's going on. And, and it's, and to Mike's point, 
this really is important to make issue because it influences everything, including tip. It, you know, uh, the, uh, towns like Sherman are projected to to shrink, um, and therefore that puts us behind on prioritization for transportation money, for housing money, for a lot of things. So the resources and the, their prioritization of what uh, of, of where the state invests are based in large part on the population forecast. And for towns like Sherburne, we're, we're all in this area uh, where we're projected to shrink even though uh, more recent data uh, says that's not gonna happen. Or, or if it is, there's an awful lot of mistake being done by the other hand in the state government. So, so um, it's a good thing, I think, to point it out. It's great you mentioned it, and, and it's, I think, so it, well, I think because of that, it belongs in the open space. Well, thank you. I, I agree with what Mike said, and I agree with what you said, so I <coughs> withdraw my suggestion. The other thing I would comment on is on page 31, the discussion of general chemical. And it just, it, it, we have um, Chuck, who was part of a general chemical team, so I'm not sure, what, Chuck, whether you've seen this or not, but it's, it just struck me as being awfully negative, the way this ended, particularly the last sentence. Uh, if I was reading this in wanting to buy a home somewhere, <laughs> this was a pretty scary thing to put in, in writing like this. And I'm not sure that it is uh, I don't. I don't think it's completely accurate. I mean, there's yeah. concern about the plume continuing to migrate, and we in the town of Natick and town of Framingham have all recommended much more extensive monitoring and DEP is doing some of that, but I, yeah, I think that's a pretty unqualified statement. It says the plume of contamination continues to migrate onto adjacent lands and towards Sherburne. And the last report that I heard was that things have, a lot of things have, are being done and that some stabilization has occurred and maybe it hasn't gotten a lot worse, but maybe it has, I, I, I just don't know. Chuck's our, our sort of resident expert here. No, I agree. That could be uh, that could be uh, qualified. That's pretty scary. <laughs> I'm scared too. Reading, rereading it. It's certainly accurate to say that it's concerned. And it's a concern. And but not that it bears monitoring or something yeah. like that. Right, it's and it's worth the monitoring. Towns of Sherburne, Natick, and Framingham are all urging additional DEP monitoring. It's just too early to tell, as usual. Yeah. It's fractured bed bedrock. Nobody quite knows what's going on down there. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm glad you're catching. Yeah. This is why okay. we're giving it to you at this point. Because those, are, those are my comments. Thank In, you, Paul. Any thanks other comments from it. up here? Terrific. Thanks, Marianne. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. Um, John and Marianne, I don't know if you want to stay. We've got a brief update on a. Um, <clears throat> There's a plan to put in 15 to 16 homes on the old Windy Low site on Route 16 in South Natick. Um, the plan apparently would require a secondary access to Everett Street. And there has been some concerns raised about traffic impact and impact on Sherburne. Uh, we have a letter <coughs> from the developer, Trask, uh, development uh, they were invited to come tonight but the they've not presented the, the plan to the native planning board yet but um, we invited the police fire department and planning board to provide any input you have on potential concerns about uh, traffic on the site uh, Mike I know this is one of the issues you were concerned about any any other background well no I, I did ask David to put this on the agenda um, back when I had control over those sorts of things. And, um, and, and uh, I also spent, as I said before, 20 minutes on Everett Street today because there was a detour from Elliott Street onto Everett Street. It's not a particularly uh, well-designed road for a lot of traffic, and I don't know what the plan is because, as, as Chuck said, uh, the plan hasn't been presented yet, but I do think we should um, be prepared to do a couple things, one would be to ask the Natick authorities, uh, planning board, and whoever else is approving this to take into account traffic impacts on Sherburne, and second would be to ask 
our planning board or our town planner to, if, if you haven't already, to be aware of this and, and consider what traffic impacts and other impacts might be on, on Sherman. It's possible that there won't be any impacts. I don't know how this road is going to be used, and it's only 15 or 16 houses. But on the other hand, there is no road there that cuts through like that now. Um, and that's a pretty sleepy road for the most part um, a lot of the day. So Today you might have been happy to have that cut through. Yeah, it would have gotten me out of that problem, wouldn't yeah. it? Uh, is it an emergency access or is it a... I don't think anybody knows, but I think it, just because it was raised by a resident and it's in the process, we ought to not lose track of the fact that mm -hmm. you know, m most developments in the Abundings towns, you know, modest-sized ones anyway, don't have anything to do with us and probably we aren't concerned about. This one has some potential impact, I guess. Yeah. And John, in fact, that's one of the questions. Is it, yeah. is it going to be always open or is it just there? You know, gated and locked as a, as a backup access for but we just yeah. don't know. Or one direction. Or yeah. Do you know anything more about it, Gino? Have you have you uh, encountered I, it? I yeah. know about it, but nothing more. Yeah, nothing more. There's no, nobody's giving you any details on, on that or anything. No. Okay. Some of the comments online that I'm sure you wouldn't see is uh, we're Rockland Street residents of Nad because there is a cut through which I, I never realized because we're on this side of it. But uh, because 27 backs up more than 16 coming out, uh, there is a cut through you can dump out of downtown Natick, and the fear is that it gives them a, shape, a straighter shot to 16. Uh, and then through they, this neighborhood. And then they cut back through Butler Street and catch 27 through the lights. I didn't know that was a thing. So that was the fear for the people on Rockland Street, Rockland in Natick, that the 15 houses aren't the issue. It, it's the cut through effect, yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> Again, it's not native residents that are cut through Sherman, it's Hopkinton residents that are cut through Sherman. Right. Yeah, and I'm always surprised when you use waves, you get detours that are going through clear residential neighborhoods that aren't used to that kind of traffic. It's Green just lane. <laughs> <laughs> trucks. Green lane comes up on waves as a shortcut. Yeah. Terrific. Any other questions or comments before we uh, move on to the town campus site well, do plan? We, do, we want, do we want to ask Tess David with talking to the Natick town manager or somebody just to put this on their radar that we're concerned and we'd like to know more? We'd yeah, like I mean, I can tell them we want to be included and yeah. so we know any site yeah. plan stuff. I think um, probably Gino gets a heads up too. Yeah, right. good. If we I can formally should. send something over. We certainly should monitor it and find out what's going on and get ourselves on the mailing list. So do you need a motion of some kind or? I don't know. I mean, I think the consensus of the board would be to have David follow okay. up on that, don't you think? Okay. Terrific. Gino. No. Thanks, David. Yeah, Thanks, Gino. I will. You will. Okay. okay. Uh, next on the agenda is the campus, town campus site plan. Sean, do you want to? Do you want to look at the site plan? Sure. Yeah. I have it. Terrific. Sean, this is a new plan since the last time we talked about this, is it? Excuse me? Is this a new plan since the last time we talked about it a couple no. months ago? So, so it's, okay, it's the same one? No, and if there was any changes that, since then, my new, I wouldn't pick them up. They're all subsurface. Okay. Utility type.
So we'll go through this again. I don't know how well we went through this. It's probably pretty hard to see. Yep. I don't know if you guys have a copy. This is Town Hall. Here's the library. Hey, Sean, can I interrupt for a second? Rick, do you have a way of picking this up so it's on camera? Uh, give me two seconds. Sure. Show. I just think it's going to be good if people at home can follow along. Starting with the <laughs> utility stuff that Eric probably understood as well. There you go. No. Not Perfect. Sure All right, so it's on there now. So we're okay. starting below grade. This big circle is the zone that. Zone one of the well. There's the well in the center. Uh, if, if you can see it close enough, you can see that the circle actually goes through Town Hall. Mm -hmm. So this is why the well is out of compliance to today's standards anyway, because there's there's parking, there's the air conditioning unit, there's the generator existing that are all within that zone. Uh, the original design had the fire suppression tank for the library and the generator sited here at the end of the parking lot, which when you drive in normally you see cruisers all parked here, that, that's about where that was going to be, off the parking lot. Obviously that was too close to the well, so that gets shifted. We needed to shift it somewhere else. It's got a pretty big footprint, and you don't want to be putting it where there's ledge or you'll be hammering ledge <coughs> near the well. Uh, so late last fall we found that along the side which is against the property line to the Caustic property and closer to Route 16, the ledge was much deeper. Um, so we'd, we'd be able to dig it without hammering ledge. Um, it got it outside, just about outside of the utilities that come in. All the utilities for, for this building come in from a, a pole out on Route 16 as well as the gas line. So it, it was a safe place to go. Anywhere towards the front we already know there's ledge outcrops. Town Hall's tank is very small compared to what's getting put in for the library, and, and they hit ledge when they put that in. So the front lawn area was, all, although it was considered, was never a place where we could site that large tank and the pumps. And the pumps are above grade now. Uh, you're not allowed to do what we did before with a bunker. So nobody really would have wanted to see that on the front lawn. So what we did is we redesigned, the design team took and shifted all that, shifted the piping, and that allowed us to be in close proximity to the generator that Town Hall was already going to replace. Uh, that generator is older than, than the remodel of the Town Hall. So we were able to buy a larger generator, or will buy a larger generator, combine them, and feed all of Town Hall and the life safety circuits at the library from the one generator with several different switches. Um, it also allows the fire pumps to be fed from the power circuit on this side, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but powering it from that transformer versus that one is quite a significant savings in copper wire. Uh, so that's kind of the underground it, it also basically interrupts all the water lines that for years have been kind of an unknown. We have the bunker that's still shown here, which most people don't realize is still the, the I think it's a 5,000 gallon tank, it's still there. Uh, it's somewhat below grade. It's got a concrete shelter around it. Ideally, we'll remove that. The plumbing right now still goes through that, it doesn't go into that tank, but it leaves Town Hall, goes into that bunker, leaves the bunker, and ends up at the police station and makes its way up the hill to both the library and the community center. Those lines will all be excavated, repaired. Uh, the only thing left on an old line will, will be the community center, obviously, but it'll be repaired and, and fixed with proper curb stops and valves in this area where we'll be excavated. Those plastic lines. The the new the new is a two inch plastic okay. line being put in. This is an old copper line, 
Oh, there's a rat. Are the other lines copper? No. Doesn't matter. There's, we think there's copper in here. It transitions to four inch duct to go to the police station. Okay. Yeah. But we haven't found the transition. Okay. They don't. We don't know. We will find it. Yeah. Um, we know within proximity, but we, no one's ever found any of these valves, which yeah. comes up on a sanitary survey, and yeah. we've gotten you know asked, mm -hmm. please define. Well, we can't can't yeah. find them. Uh, we'll find them with a back truck now. And the intent, just so you know, the plan is to feed everything with temporary lines, which might sound like a big deal, but if you notice, the whole south side of Natick is right now on temporary potable yeah. lines. Yeah. Uh, We'll feed the community center. We'll we'll breach that line probably under the lawn. The library's already cut off, or will be, and we just have to feed the police station. The police station obviously can't ever go without water, even on a weekend. So we have to feed it. Uh, there'll be temporary measures while all the electrical work's getting done. The, the, the town hall will go on a full generator 24 hours a day for a certain amount of time so that all the site, the the electrical work can be done. Every source has to come out and pull the transformer, um, rewire it for the pump feeds, and then drop it back in. Um, I think I might have gone past the drawing that shows the parking. <coughs> As it's shown right now, I believe there's 14 spaces being created in a mix between the parking between the, basically in front of the police station. Show up on the camera. I thought you didn't like angle parking. Put it on. Gino. <laughs> what is he going like the angle parking or? Yeah, I have a <laughs> So we, we're all familiar with what's happening over here, obviously. This is the loop as it was extended. It's still not finished because it doesn't have the curving. Um, the tree's being removed. We took out a couple islands that were really in the way. Um, which allowed some better ADA access for the sidewalks. <coughs> uh, this really didn't change much. Those, those two things did. But the main change from the original plan is this side. Obviously, as soon as we start touching this side, we have to accommodate fire access, which before we touch it, we don't really make it. You can picture that a 10-wheel fire truck doesn't make that corner very well it's hard to make it right now uh, so the engineers had to start working with those radiuses the tank as shown before I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this it's five feet below grade to the top so it, we're parking on it the only thing you can't park on obviously there's a there is a structure there I think it stands eight feet tall it has the pumps in it and everything else so that not only you can't park next to it either because there's a fire hydrant there that obviously they need access to and we can't restrict access to this building either with all these changes so there's an increase in traffic flow it's, it's 20 feet wide now and these spaces remain the same that are out front there's a couple more there and then obviously these angled spaces I think these are two extra two additionals as well what ended up happening the parking spaces to make them fit actually go beyond the property line that was there. So the stone wall will end up getting rebuilt or not rebuilt. It's it's our decision, but pushed over slightly. Most of the stone wall's gone right now anyway, because that was the access to the Costa property. And this is shaded just because it's gonna they're gonna uh, repair that handicapped spot, which is advantageous to us because it's all <coughs> out of grade and not really compliant anyway. Those are the major changes in the, in the plan. Last time we talked about whether you're connecting, whether the roadway that goes between the island, are we going to take get rid of that and make it a green space, or are you going to so leave it? So that is a decision the board can make. It's, it, it has nothing to do with this plan. Okay. As it stands, 
as it's being approved. It certainly has nothing to do with DEP because DEP is looking this way. Um, I tend to think it'll work well. I'd want to make a final decision before we go finish paving, but it doesn't look like we're going to finish paved this year anyway. Uh, it, it's going to be, we'll get pavement back down, I hope, but I don't, it won't be the finished course. That'll be next spring. Sean, can you point out where the well is in the 100 foot on that plan? On this one? Yeah. There's, so the, there's the well. Okay. And there's the 100 foot going through. Okay. So those two spaces were added within the 100 feet? I don't know if they're added or they're just, I don't think they're added. I think they're just showing the, the, the cut and replace because this is, uh, this is one of the material. So those are existing spaces. I think these are existing. It, they're just showing where they have to basically work, pull up asphalt and take it out. Uh, I may not have grabbed the best drawing to okay. uh, just show that. It's more than 100 feet, right? What's, the, What's that? The zone one's. God, it's more oh. than 100 feet. Isn't zone it? one for that's 100. Oh, is it? Okay. Because um, it's grandfathered, I, I think. I forget what zone two oh, is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, they'd never let you do that now. Yeah. I'm sorry, zone 100 because it's grandfathered? Septic I believe so. Oh, there you go. Because <laughs> that's our regulation. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for uh, just housing, yeah. So, yeah. House. I think that's right, Sean. Because I don't think they'd ever let you do 100 feet now. John. Any other questions? I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it cost? So, I was told there's a number, to but I was told I couldn't have it yet. Uh, it, it comes with much disappointment, and I let it be known. Uh, for those who didn't watch the earlier meeting, for those that didn't watch the earlier meeting, the question is, what are the costs? Yeah. Well, I, I did say it again just now, but <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, as I've said I, all yeah, along, I don't have the cost implication. And I don't have the time. Okay. To, to so you said there is a cost, but nobody's giving it to you? It's definitely a cost. I mean, somebody knows what the cost is and... Well, the contractor knows. He has a number, but he wouldn't, he was still reviewing it. VP was still reviewing it. And, uh, and if he handed it to me today, I wouldn't have brought it. Yeah, yeah. There's no way I would have brought it. Yeah. Um, the design team has their uh, pricing consultant who went through, it's pretty complicated if you, if you can picture the amount of deducts and ads and uh, it's gonna take some time to take A, B and mix the two and come up with a number. Uh, but there's several things that can happen concurrently with some of the work. The generator's already ordered. Uh, it's due in, we, I think we got an email today, it's due in in August. It's no longer a critical path because it won't be ready for it. Honestly. Was it diesel? The diesel it's generator. natural gas. Oh, is it real? Yeah. Uh, I guess that's why it's in the zone one. <laughs> it, yeah, it definitely would not be in the zone yeah. one. Uh, <coughs> What's going to happen to the old generator? Does it have any resale value? It or? has zero resale value. It's actually <laughs> against the law to sell it in the United States because it's not compliant to uh, emission standards. Please. So where can we sell it? North Korea. I was told we could. Uh, <laughs> At Waverly Salvage. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, yeah, I'm not sure. You're not helping our diplomatic efforts at all here. <laughs> Sell it to North Korea. I suppose maybe I could auction it legally, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Solidly. We'll see it on eBay right after this. Oh. <laughs> all right, good. Thanks, Sean. This is good. Well, if I could, uh, Sean and I disagree on this plan, and he knows it, and I'm going to be voting no. Um, I can give you the long version or the short version, but I'll, I'll give you the short version. As you all know, that the um, the way this plan is set up is in a denied mode at DEP, and uh, we have asked for reconsideration of that denial, and papers have been submitted. Uh, DEP is not comfortable with this plan. I. I believe that we're better off working cooperatively with DEP and with more cooperation we would get the denial removed faster and ultimately DEP is looking for better environmental and public health uh, 
public safety considerations. And the concerns are the well. Is it, is it, is it, do you have any concerns other than the well, or is the concerns around the well, DPs? I, I don't know all the details. I just know they're uncomfortable with this. So for all those reasons, I'm, I'm going to vote now. I mean, do we have the correspondence from DP? Mm -hmm. There was nothing in the packet here at all. There wasn't even the plans. Yeah, it was a while ago you had the, <coughs> the um, you guys were copying on. No, what other responses? So, right. Is, uh, is there a communication yeah, that's, that's okay. Paul? So, yeah, that's all well. We, and, and, the, and the resubmittal. And so this week, I reached out directly. I, I hesitated to do it for quite a while uh, because there was some communication with DEP that uh, was unfortunate between some mm -hmm. contractors and subcontractors, uh, which, which politically wasn't really all that great for us. And we have Whitewater representing us with DEP. And so because they're the operator of the well, I, I left it to them. I did finally reach out to Zach Peters just the other day via email, uh, just letting him know that I, I was going to be presenting tonight hoping to at least give an update. Uh, his response was that we, he, he expects we'll see something early next week. Uh, that, that's really all I can ask for. I don't, that I know for a fact that lots of people will confirm that they're pretty swamped, uh, the Northeast region. And I remember our responses, they were, they could be subjective. He could go either way in right. giving a judgment, so you don't want to annoy him. You don't want to nag him. I get that. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not an ideal plan. The ideal plan is that well goes away. And if the well went away, actually the tank would have to go away. We wouldn't even need it. But we're a decade late on that. Sean, are you looking for an approval from the board on this plan? Um, or is this just an update? Mechanically, yeah. I mean, at, at some point we're going to get to the point where the you, being the building owner, has an approved a plan that the contractor is working on a price for DEP is working on approval of. Are we are we at that point? Is this? We could be. I mean, we, yeah. I don't have an approval in hand from DEP, um, but we've directed the contractor to price this work up. Um, the design team has spent a significant amount of time working on it. Uh, I'm not sure how that path would go to turn it around. Um, and, and come up with something, you know, small details come up. We there was there was some subsurface things that uh, we released to DEP a couple weeks ago, but it had to do with the trenching. I was going to say, does does DEP are they actually reviewing this plan? I thought they were reviewing kind of the current non-compliance issues. With like, no, they know, reviewed this area. entire package. Okay, which I thought we sent. You. I, I, didn't, I, I saw can. the letter. I saw, I saw the, the, the response to comments that we sent out. That's and all I have. In yeah. with it was this entire set of drawings. Oh, yeah, that they wanted this entire set of drawings. They wanted the exact particulars okay. of what was going, because it's a significant amount of work inside that zone. I remember reference attachments, but I don't think we got the attachments. Right. But I, that almost doesn't matter. If right. they are actually looking at it now, and they're going to provide a response um, early next week, do we think we're going to have a meeting? I, I'm thinking just a couple things here. Well, like Paul said, if DEP comes back to us and say no on this anyway, I mean, why are we even voting on it? Right. Number two, we still don't have the costs or the time or any. I think there's there's no way I could vote to support this with where it's at right now. Well, and, I think we need to hear what the DEP thinks, and we want to hear some estimation of what it's going to cost before I could ever support anything. So Mary reached out, and I think the trustees were looking for an executive session in July. So, so, Sean, we've, we've heard um, from Paul that he has reason to think that DEP is not going to approve this. We've heard from you that there really are not a lot of other options for how to handle the tank and the generator and the piping. <coughs> so if DEP disapproves this, what's the next step? What, what, what's, what's plan B? Is there a plan B? There are options. They cost money. It's really plan C. This was plan B. All right. So, we'll, okay, that's semantics. It, 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 is, do, you have a, do you have another answer? And it, is it just that it costs money, or is, or is it that it's not practical to do it the way this whole place is configured? 
if I can say it, speak yeah. it. What I suspect People will look happen. People at it too, yeah. Yeah, what I suspect will happen, it's not going to be a yes, no. It's not going to be a proven, not approved. They're going to say, because remember we had many responses, so they're going to say, okay, we don't agree with this one. So you're going to address the issue about impervious area. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Or you're going to address maybe the crossing of the trenching. So it's going to be kind of a line item. So it's, I don't think Sean can come up with a plan B, C, or D, because you don't know what their issue is going to be. They're not going to be like, rejected and mail it back to you. They're going to go, they're going to go through the response and say like, well, fine, fine, no, fine, fine, no. You know, and you're just going to address those no's. Yeah, it was a very detailed Perfect. listing of their concerns. And the mm -hmm. and that's what it's like. I suspect yeah. the impervious area within the water, I suspect that'll be one of them. And then we'll put in a rain garden or something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's, um, and I think you have to kind of see that, see the responses, and then, then know better. I agree. So is, it, so is it a cost factor? Is that the reason we haven't sort of proactively tried to address as many of DEP's comments like that with solutions that they might like better than whatever well, we gave them? I mean, to be perfectly blunt, DEP doesn't like that well there. I understand. We put our septic system 125 feet away from that well. Yep. I'm not even sure that was allowed then, but either way, the first thing they looked at, it wasn't this version of the plan, they said, what is that next door to the well? So there's actually nothing we could do with that well to make them happy. The building's in it, the generator's in it. The best option would be take that well and go put it on the other side of town and feed a, you know, a, an eight inch water main that we installed 20 years ago. That would make DEP happy with this site. But shy of that, we have to do something between those two. Well, is DEP looking at this big lot we've got next door and saying, why don't you put exactly. the well yeah. on that big lot why next isn't door? The, why isn't the well? The, yeah. No. Okay. We well. almost probably could never put the well on that. Well why not? Still. Because this has a 100-foot radius. That well would need three or 400-foot radius, and you don't have it. Well, yeah. we, they're because already it's new. Because it's, it's my grandfather. it would take a couple of years to get a well out there, and it, just the permitting, I'm told, would be a couple hundred thousand dollars. And it's you're not even guaranteed you're going to get good well there. The zone one would be it would be a the little protection, bit. and then you would. So the so the building would still uses. be be within the zone. Well, yeah. you just you lose all the grandfather. Yeah. Well, the two roads would. Right, right, right. right. Chuck Nancy has. Yeah. Remember, these two roads are merging together. There's no point in that yeah, yeah. that you get far enough away from that septic system, and away from those two roads, and Scott's house. Mm -hmm. We'd have to buy his house too. There is a uh, existing well there. For the house, it, it, it's it, not a public well, water supply. Actually, right. if they so, thought hard enough about that existing well, and I still think they might, they'd make us grout fill that well and abandon it because we don't know that it doesn't communicate with that well. It's pretty close. It's only about 180 feet. Or something. When when we tore down the house, we made sure that the well stayed and was capped, so right. there, there is an existing well. And there. The open wells were over here, and they got filled. But the other, the other issue also is uh, longer term, eventually we're going to have to expand Town Hall to the south. And so now we're going to have this building, when the time comes to do work on this building, I don't think you were part of the uh, rebuilding of this town building, but some of us were, like I was, and a lot of constraints about that but the, the the idea always was that if we ultimately 10 years 20 30 years from now we're going to have to expand town hall to the south that's south it, yes it's just the, the plan has north to the right so all, all the construction is ultimately going to take place for the our local government is going to be moving even more towards the well, if not on top of the but well. That's a mute subject. Because the well and the tank will be useless by then. Because long before we get to the point where we have to do that, we need a water su supply. We, we've already we've already exhausted that and we we can't do any more work here DEP's not going to let us do anything more with that well there that's and they're certainly not going to let us put an additional but that but that's the whole point that that relying on that well at this point doesn't even kick the can down the road it just it kicks the can to the curb it was a colossal waste of money yeah i agree 
It shouldn't be there. We shouldn't have spent money on it. We should have fixed that before we started the addition, but we can't we can't change that now. That's a huge liability for the town, and I, I, we have done nothing to improve it. That still exists. But that's a topic for the town center water options. Because this building needs water, that building needs water, that building needs water, and the one across the street and the two churches do, and they all need fire suppression too to, to be up to compliance. It's not just a liability, it's just a question of, of the health and safety of people and the health and safety of people who work in this building and in the library and in the adjacent areas. That's why I can't support this plan. Fancy? cellar hole that we fill, which I think it would be outside your 100 foot thing, and, and you know that's not ledge because we fill the sizable cellar hole that the house is on, and getting that out and putting your tank in there, I mean it would mean a little bit longer run, but you would be running outside. The tank is outside. It's the digging right next to the well that they're concerned about. And we're stuck doing that either way. We can't get to the caustic property without going by the well. We can't get there. So it's the trenching within the... Could you right. I got the tank out. That's why we did that. You can't trench in front of Town Hall, could you? Right. Is that another option? To Do trench what? No. in front of the Town Hall? We talked about going to the right oh, no. side. Instead of going side. through, instead of going, going out towards around. 16 and in front of Town Hall. Oh, no. You can't trench it that way? No. Then it doesn't trench through the... It, the distance would be such that... Would, it, it, I mean, it, it almost wouldn't work hydraulically. you got to remember, that's the fire... The, the huge fire pumps in there mm -hmm. protecting that building. In lieu of having a <laughs> city water. I mean. You're a comedian. This is why I wanted some money in the from the state on the environmental bond issue that... Um, Dave and I were talking about because if we had state money to fund this and I think they would fund it if we had two or three million dollars from the state to fix this and they want us to fix it and there's motivation to fix it it would change the economics it would relieve the taxpayers of, of a huge potential expenditure whether we do it now or whether we do it 10 years from now and so on there is there is there is an interest in the state to fix this problem f with us if we are willing to work collaboratively and cooperatively with them. I'm saying the problem's not on this plan the problem starts here and ends at Pine Hill and everywhere in between don't fix this there's 400 kids up at Pine Hill drinking out of a well. It's right next to the cemetery. That's the same problem. We're not going to spend $2 million fixing this. we got a library that's half finished. We have to finish it. I wish we weren't putting a fire tank in at all. If we had a water main that had water in it, we wouldn't need a tank or pumps or the generator for that matter. It'd gravity feed from Pine Hill. But that's not what we're fixing right now. We have to finish this library. And if we become the delay on the library, then... Option B doesn't really matter, and neither does option C. But if we can't get a plan approved from DEP, we can't finish it anyway. That's the problem. How soon? If this plan, we don't know whether this plan's even approved, so that, that's, the, we don't. that's the point. But it's a lot closer than it was. How soon really do you need the segments vote? Because really, I mean, if DEP, next week, the week after, they actually provide comments, we're meeting again on the 12th, right? Something like that? 11th. Yeah. 11th. Yeah. Well, the 11th and the 12th. Yeah. <laughs> we get plenty of meetings. <laughs> so, so we're meeting again then. I mean, is it literally like, I mean, is it going to be change orders if we don't approve this? You know what I mean? Is it delays? No, or is it no. To schedule the project? No, I don't want you to vote on this time. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of comfort levels if we saw that. Because like I said, right. I suspect, and I could be wrong, a DP's comment is going to be kind of line item and things in, they can be addressed. Because I actually, you know, I, I agree with Sean here where it is uh, no matter what, that well can't really move nearby because it, you lose all your grandfathering. You have your zone one right there, and uh, it's either, I agree with them, that's either a full water supply or it's just grandfathered well. You know, there's no other solution in that way. And you just got to do with what you have. 
know what I mean? But I'd like to see the lineup before we actually prove it. It makes sense because they're gonna. I, I suspect they're gonna talk about the trenching and the, the impervious surface. You know, the things basically wherever we went and said like we're not in compliance, but whatever. <laughs> you know, and that's right. that's where they're gonna have uh, comments to it. So I, I I agree with Eric. I think we've got to act in the world we actually live in, not the imaginary world where DEP's given us money that they're not giving us. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think we've got to take care of business when DP tells us what we need to do do it and and get the library project going and if they tell us we can't do it then we've got a different decision to make right it at least gives us a direction so assuming we hear back from DEP this will be an agenda item at our next meeting either, either the 11th or the 12th so well, I'd like you to put it as an agenda item now for your next meeting so I have a deadline to give to the contractor that fine but we need some real numbers yep. Yeah. Perfect. I'm not doing this again. Right. Let's put it on the agenda. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Anything else? Thanks, Sean. Um, Sharon, we're ready for item four, the financial operational um, matters. And that's typically when I give you an update on the library construction project. And since last the last time I updated you, <coughs> I haven't received any additional invoices. We haven't received any additional forecasting, so it's I, I have no update. So no news. No okay. news. Right. Yeah. But I had a question. Earlier today, I had asked about the uh, proposed transfers for year-end. Mm -hmm. And people told me, look at your memos. And I looked at your memos, and there are all these expenditures mm -hmm. and percentages. And it goes on for pages and pages. Yes. And, and, and my uh, non-accounting mm -hmm. world. You know what it, I, could we just have a little chart saying absolutely. it's like <coughs> six numbers absolutely. that we're looking at right now they may change mm -hmm. but yeah I'd like to see if we're looking okay. at a, 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 a big hole or are we looking at small little adjustments like okay. I, I really okay. didn't get a sense I can um, I can do that very quickly and I can actually send you something tomorrow I bet you Steve would probably like to see it Steve did you hear what Paul was asking it's Sorry, he's uh, she's gonna come up with a chart for the different potential transfers coming up okay, and I figured it'd be very helpful for you guys as well yeah yeah right. yep. yeah so I don't think we have those numbers yet right no we're I mean we're still you know and we still have another week and a half before we close things out but I'm definitely you know giving people information um, on a weekly basis and letting them know that so, it's so critical you know that people <laughs> stay. Just, so you know in addition to the meeting on the 11th we scheduled tentatively a meeting on the 12th in case there's some issues that come up at the last minute. So then so we I, can have another meeting the next so night if we need to resolve anything. Okay, uh, I can ask my team. I'm not available, but I can ask. Okay. My team. I think we're skeptical that we'll need it, but we wanted to go ahead and okay. put it on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can certainly get something out tomorrow, and then you know, as as more information becomes available, I'll, I'll let you know. I can do that. Terrific. Um, David, do we have a town administrator report? Yep, just a few items. Um, Council on Aging held its first thank you to our first responders breakfast at the Pilgrim Church this past um, Monday morning. And thank you to the COA staff and volunteers who helped make the breakfast a big success and a couple of people. Yeah, it was that was a tremendous event. That was really nice. It, it, was, was, it was really well done. It was a great idea. Uh, we've scheduled the joint meeting with advisory committee for July 11th and the memory statue restoration work has been completed. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the debris moved away from it. Uh, we've invited Peggy Novak and Susie Wheelwright to speak about the project. We don't have a date on that yet. Just have to say on the memory statue, uh, just a funny anecdote. When we would drive by it, my daughter has been into Harry Potter, and she said it looked like a dementor while they were doing the <laughs> 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 while they were doing the work with the black cover on it. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and then the, um, there was a notice that went out the railroad crossing on Prospect Street near Cold Street will be closed from 7 a.m. Friday until late after, uh, Friday, June 22nd until late afternoon, Monday, June 25th, and to seek alternate routes and plan accordingly. And Prospect Street residents will not be able to access their homes via Coolidge Street during this time frame. I had a question on that. Do we know, uh, are they doing a series of improvements or is this just kind of one time because they're improving the line in general you know what I mean so are we going to see other um, crossings improved 
Yeah, I mean, I assume that this would take care of it and they move on to the next crossing, but um, I don't know if Sean knows. Sean. That crossing's pretty messed up, isn't it? At least the last yeah. time I crossed it. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a bad location. It is. I mean, I'm hoping it's a one time, but I'll find out. Yeah, that's what I meant, like, just do other ones in, in town. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're improving the rail. Right. And, uh, the rail area there. But that one's particularly bad. That, yeah, that crossing's a disaster. I ride my bike over. Yeah, me too. That's, <laughs> it's not nice. And in terms of sight lines or in terms of the surface? Surface. Just how rough it is? Yeah. yeah. And even then, it's close to cool. Ch change in grain poles and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've got a bigger problem with the town of Framingham with having no culverts or viaducts for those trains that go through framing. So you don't know anybody who can help over there. <laughs> I, just, I grew up in a railroad town. Let me tell you, it was a lot easier to get around Improved there. Blandon Ave. Remember Blandon Ave? That's been bad for years. People ride the side of it, and all of a sudden, boom, it's like less. Any uh, That's it. selectman's reports? No, my report no. was on that first, first responder breakfast, which was great. Terrific. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>